If no one has yet heard Professor Takriti speak, you are in for something. And it is uh, a great, great honor to introduce him. Professor Takriti is the inaugural holder of the Arab American Educational Foundation Chair in Modern Arab History at the University of Houston. And this is a very, uh, quite a unique chair. It was uh, through the engagement and the involvement of the Arab community. It's a marvelous uh, model of pedagogy uh, in where uh, it's actually the grassroots that support those foundation chairs to be telling the kind of stories that he is able to tell us. So an expert on many, many things. He is a scholar on anti-colonialism, revolutions, and transnational movements in Palestine and the Arab world. He's the author of a multiple award-winning book, Monsoon Revolutions, Republican Sultans and Empires in Oman, uh, which was in, uh, published by OUP. And uh, my co-pilot in a seven or eight year initiative to, which is now launched since last year, which is a digital uh, humanities resource. It's a research and teaching resource on the Palestinian revolution. And uh, I could say many things about Abid, many extraordinary things, but I think it's best to let him do it in his own words. So please join me in welcoming Abid back to the UK. Well, thank you very much, Karma, for uh, a fantastic introduction. Uh, it is a great honor to be introduced by Karma because everything I, I will speak about today and everything I've been writing about is deeply influenced by her ideas, her thoughts, and her mentorship over many years uh, since I arrived to Oxford as a doctoral student in uh, 2005. And um, um, as she mentioned, uh, it's a, a really uh, special thing to be engaging uh, with the question of Palestine through the prism of uh, a community uh, chair, the chair that I hold at the University of Houston, because it allows for a certain uh, freedom, in speaking about it, uh, that uh, is sometimes denied or is uh, denied in many places, most places. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to have uh, that uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm also grateful to be here uh, at the Institute of Education, uh, especially because it's uh, connected to the legacy of a scholar that I uh, think we should all emulate and I think that has done a great model uh, uh, for how to talk about Palestine uh, in ways uh, that are free. Uh, the late uh, Dr. Abdel Latif Tibawi, who um, I think uh, uh, most of you would not recognize his name because he He's a very old-time figure. Uh, he, his heydays were in the 50s, 60s, 70s. He produced an enormous amount of uh, radical work in that period. And he engaged with the question of Palestine in a very thorough way. Most of his books are not known, but I really encourage you to go back to them. Uh, his study of how the mandate was set up in Palestine is an absolute classic. It deals with just three years, but with such great depth. And it really captures uh, what cannot be described as anything but the horror of it all. And anybody who's worked on Palestine and Palestine's history uh, will know what I mean by when I say that when you go through these documents, when you go through these archives, and especially the colonial archives, you can feel that horror. You can feel that uh, terrifying sense of uh, a story that you know the ending of that, of, of that story, you know where it was heading, but also where that direction was so clear from the very beginning, from the uh, structure that was set up, from the uh, mechanisms that were put in place, uh, from uh, the ways in which this was so centralized uh, and so organized. I've studied many colonial projects, and Palestine, I can tell you, is one uh, of the ones that strike you for the level of centralization, organization, and methodical implementation uh, that uh, is associated uh, with it. Now, I'm going to start by uh, mentioning uh, uh, something regarding the title of this lecture, which is uh, Decolonizing Palestinian History. Um, it was a title actually proposed by, uh, by Omar. 
I wouldn't use decolonizing, although I, t I told him I'm going to critique it. Uh, and I'm going to accept the title so that I can have the opportunity to critique it. I think we have to be very careful <laughs> in relation to Palestine uh, uh, when it comes to something like the decolonizing model. In fact, we have to be very careful with the decolonizing model in relation to any colonial situation because we don't want to just decolonize. We want to liberate. In fact, in the languages of the peoples that are oppressed, generally speaking, you'd hardly find a word like decolonization. That certainly does not exist in Arabic. We use the word tahrir. Okay, we don't use the word decolonize. And that's telling uh, because it has to do with something greater than just uh, removing some colonial residues here and there. Colonialism is with us. It lives around us. It is something to be opposed, something to be dealt with, and something to be liberated from. Uh, that's why I like the word liberation much more. Or anti-colonialism. And there's some people complain about, oh, anti-colonialism sounds negative. You know what? We need sometimes uh, negation. Um, negation is important. When you see uh, an awful reality in front of you. When you see a reality of slavery, you want to negate slavery. When you see a reality of tyranny, you want to negate tyranny. When you see a reality of uh, patriarchy or class oppression, you want to negate that. You want to remove it so that you can replace it with something better. And the same applies to colonialism. So when we're dealing with Palestine, I think it's very important for us to liberate ourselves from the frameworks that enable this colonialism to continue. And the first step is by recognizing that what's taking place in Palestine is colonialism. Because when you open your textbooks, you will find, if anybody here has taken a Palestine course in their life, who's taken a Palestine course in, in this room? Has anybody studied anything in rela relation to Palestine at university, college, anywhere? OK, what are, you, what are you confronted with? Usually, the title of the course is what? Arab-Israeli conflict, that's one way, uh, that's what they call it, you know. The Arab-Israeli conflict, that's, that's how it's dealt with, the conflict model. And what you think is, it's just, oh, two bickering people have just been put up in one space, and if only they would sit together and uh, have a kumbaya moment, then everybody's going to be happy and everything's over. You know, let's just all hold hands and be happy, and then <laughs> things are over. And of course, it's the extremists with the negative thoughts uh, that are not willing to compromise that are the problem. Um, this is the sort of typical approach that comes out of this conflict model. There's an entire industry around this conflict model. The so-called peace and conflict studies, you know, programs, every department ha has, every university, you know, wants to establish them. In the 90s, they were so popular. And part of their popularity came out of the peace industry that emerged in Palestine. Billions and billions and billions of pounds were uh, put into uh, this entire foundations were established uh, to pursue uh, this industry. But all what this industry does and all what this uh, uh, title does is it prevents us from calling things by their name. This is not a conflict. This is colonization. And in the days when they started the program of colonizing Palestine, people like Theodor Herzl spoke about colonizing Palestine. Theodor Herzl was the founder of political Zionism. He was very clear, if you go and read his uh, book uh, on the Jewish state, his famous pamphlet, he's very clear about the need to establish a colonial company, the need to colonize that space. If you go and check his diaries, he says that you know, we need to acquire the, this land. We're not going to have a problem in acquiring it uh, from the rich big landowners. But then uh, uh, we, we'll, ha we'll have to deal with the poor people that don't want to leave. Those we'll force them to leave. Okay? So that's a very clear idea of colonization. And of course, when uh, it came to the practical setup, people were referring, including the uh, fo founders of this project, of colonizing Palestine, they were referring to uh, the uh, early uh, uh, colonies as colonies. Sometimes they would call them settlements, sometimes they'd call them colonies. They didn't have a problem referring to them as such. When they established uh, the uh, initiatives to colonize the space, they called it the Jewish Colonization Organization. You know, that was an official title. We're not making this stuff up. Go back to the archives, you see it. People were very forthcoming about it. In fact, 
they were celebrating it in, the, in that time because it was associated with the ideas of the mission civilisatrice and spreading civilization and, and colonialism was seen as a positive thing in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Part of the selling point to the British Labour Party, for example, all these, uh, uh, which was, by the way, the biggest enthusiastic supporter of uh, Zionism in that period, was that this is going to be a civilizing mission. And here I really recommend that you read a brilliant book uh, by uh, Paul Kellerman called The British Left and Zionism, A History of a Divorce. He goes very thoroughly uh, um, you know, through the archives of that period and shows the ways in which the left embraced this project precisely because it was colonial, because it was going to bring civilization, development. You know, now we have a, a different kind of left, hopefully. But of course, it's under fire for uh, embracing uh, a more anti-colonial ideology. So we need to engage in different ways with this question. We need to not be afraid and tense every time we speak about this question because I see, when I speak about this question in Britain, I see fear, I see anxiety, I see people having a lot of feelings inside of them, a lot of thoughts inside of them, a lot of intellectual engagement that they're unable to express because they feel they're walking on eggshells. Anytime they want to speak about this, they get accused, smeared, associated with ideas that they would find abhorrent and that in so many cases they've dedicated their lives to fighting. So let's be clear about calling things about their name with courage, not being afraid for calling a spade a spade. What happened in Palestine was colonialism. The documents from that period, call it as such, open any British document from that time. Go to the Hope Simpson report, for example. You know, he speaks of the colonies that were put in place. I speak of a native population. Even if you go to the UN partition plan, which actually was a shameful you know, destruction of our people on the hands of the so-called international community at the time, that shameful document spoke of the Palestinians as the indigenous inhabitants of the land. They were very clear about that. But then it had a whole thing about, well, and oh, but at the same time, there is a Jewish historical association with it. And at the moment, uh, uh, you know, there needs to be a resolution uh, to the uh, uh, problems of the Jewish populations in Europe. So it's convenient, you know, if you go through that text. So who has to pay the price? The indigenous population, not the European countries that created anti-Semitism and Nazism and, and fascism and all of these intellectual currents. Not the political parties that supported that. Not the Tory party in this country which created the, uh, uh, the anti-Semitic immigration law of 1905, which prevented Jewish refugees from escaping the pogroms back then and has prevented them later on from uh, uh, escaping the, the, the horrors in, in Germany in the, in the Holocaust. No. Not Winston Churchill which was, was a rabid anti-Semite, but by the way, anti-Palestinian. He compared us to dogs and, and also said that uh, uh, like the peoples of, uh, of Australia and like the native peop peoples of the US, it was okay for us to be replaced by a higher grade race. That's the way, word, words he used. So when we're dealing with the situation, we have to be very forthcoming. Colonists, natives. We should not be embarrassed by that. When you open a textbook, you should see those words. Because when you're studying the colonization of the Americas, we can speak about colonists there. People are forthcoming nowadays about, about that. When you speak about Australia, hopefully you will hear about that. You know, there is a, a trend now of being honest about these things. Because when we're more honest about them, we can see what's happening in the present, by the way. It's after the Second World War after colonialism became a bad word, that there was a heavy centralized effort on the part of the Israeli government and its Hasbara machine, which is a, a, basically Hasbara, if you don't know, it's a, uh, the Israeli government's word for propaganda. Okay? They wanted to dissociate what their actions from colonialism. 
They want to call it something else. It's just conflict. And if it's just conflict, then it's okay because you can acquire as much land as you want and say it's just conflict. We're in the middle of conflict. And then nobody can recognize what's going on. So a lot of the struggle of our people back then in that period when this shift began to start, colonialism became a bad word, was to say, no, this is a colonized situation. And all the other countries in the world and all the other peoples in the world automatically recognize it. They understood what it was from the very beginning. That's why they were in solidarity with us. Not because we were a fashionable cause or a profitable cause to be with. Palestine can bring you a lot of headaches. But Palestine also can bring you a lot of principles, a lot of um, um, ideas. It can be a case that actually tests your capacity in dealing with this big question of our age, the question of the freedoms of people across the world. Precisely because you're, you're not allowed to talk about it. Now, another bad model, they speak about it as uh, Arab and Jew. Oh, it's just Arabs and Jews fighting with each other. And from time immemorial, there were uh, Arabs and Jews. No, if we want to liberate ourselves from this colonial framework, this Arab and Jew framework was actually invented by the British. There is no dichotomy, a genuine uh, dichotomy between Arab and Jew because there were millions of Arab Jews. Zionism did not want to admit that there are Arab Jews. They wanted to say, if you're Jewish, you're only Jewish. They wanted to de-Arabize all the Iraqi Jews, all the Moroccan Jews. You know, the British were totally down with that because they set up the, the whole framework of the mandate. And really, the biggest conceptual uh, um, set of crimes took place when the mandate was being set because they, they organized things in this way for us, in this colonial way. That yeah, there's the Arabs and the, and the Jews and uh, somehow poor Britain is just trying to mediate between the two. You know, it's such a, you feel sorry for these British officials, you know, they control the whole world at the time and they make you feel sorry for them. They're stuck in this dilemma. What a hard dilemma to be in, you know. They're, and they're, there's t these children that are very, uh, you know, naughty and they're fighting with each other and Britain, the nanny, is trying to make things better for, for both of them, but, you know, it's so, it's so hard. Yeah. So you end up with this situation. By the way, the, uh, the image of children, they were using it all the time in that, in that literature. And you continue to see it to this day. It's in popular perceptions, it's so common. In, in TV series, it's so common. And you know who that helps? That helps the status quo. That helps whoever is more powerful there. That helps the colonists. That helps the colonial state of Israel. Because then they can continue to do the constant land grab, the ongoing colonization, which is what's happening today in Gaza and the West Bank and everywhere else. If you turn it into, oh, it's just Arabs and Jews fighting, whoever is stronger will win in the fight. And they'll keep on grabbing. That's exactly what's happening. Another, you know, uh, a slightly better version, modified version, is Palestinians and Zionists. Some progressive folks use that. Again, by it doesn't attach an actual value to things when you say it that way. There's no moral judgment in that. What it is, is it becomes a people versus an ideology. But what do you get more than that? When you actually explain colonist, native, and you start using that in your articles, in your books, if you write them, in your essays, if you're a student, if, in your everyday conversations as, as a person. Yes, sure, you'll get pushback. But nowadays, I only write in those terms, by the way. I refuse to uh, write in any other term. And you get like these editors that come and complain, oh, yeah, why, why are you using this? You know, um, uh, it should be like Arab and Jew or Zionist. No, no, I reject that. Let us call things by their name. Okay. Now, problem number two, in addition to calling a spade a spade, which is very important in this case, because anything else is evasion, and anything else will help cover up for what's going on to the, uh, right now, in the case of the Palestinian people, when we want to talk about frameworks. You know, I already hinted at the conflict framework. It's no good. I already spoke about that. The second framework that we deal with all the time is conflicting nationalisms. You see all these, uh, you know, uh, books with titles like One Land, Two Peoples. That, that, that must, be a, must be in like a hundred books, by the way, this, uh, this word. 
One line, two people. Oh, uh, you know, subhanallah, for those who understand Arabic. One line, two people. It just happened to be that way, and we end up with, with this uh, situation. What does that even mean? What does this conflicting nationalisms even mean? Like, they, uh, that, that somehow, if the Palestinians were not nationalists, then we wouldn't have a problem. That's what it means. If Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian peasants, by the way, who were fighting these colonists on the ground in their villages long before nationalism arrived in, uh, uh, into their dictionary, okay, those we would not be able to understand their struggles. We would not be able to understand the people in Wadi al-Hawarith who were displaced from their lands and tried to fight it in the days of uh, colonization. We would not be able to understand all the early villages around the early uh, uh, Zionist colonies that were being pushed off their lands. This is about a process of a takeover, a land grab that people were feeling. And to think that the Palestinians were stupid enough not to know that it's bad for them, organically, they didn't need no ideology to understand that. Now, sometimes people confuse two processes when it comes to this, this issue. Uh, you know, they confuse the adoption of nationalism with the adoption of resistance to this project. The resistance to this project was there wherever the effects of that project were felt. However, there was a lag time between the establishment of the first colonies and the uh, universal understanding, universalization of the understanding that this is a dangerous trend. Because it took time for people in other areas, you know, before there was mass communications in the way we see now where there's WhatsApp, you get something in two seconds, you know what's going on in the other village. You know, in those days, it took a while for villages that were far away from this action to figure out what's going on. But in, there were lots of people that knew what was going on. There were lots of people that were talking about it. And in due course, opposition to it became almost universal on the ground. That is what they describe in the literature as nationalism. But nationalism, as we know, as a, as a, as a framework, is generally a bad word in today's world. So suddenly it becomes, oh yeah, we start confusing this opposition to an ultra-nationalist project, which is Zionism. By the way, that is a very ideological project. And that is a, a, an ultra-nationalist ideological project. Because it was actually on the margins of Jewish ideologies that were present in the 19th century. You had a lot of people were assimilationists. A lot of people were or, or religious. You had the Orthodox Jews that refused the idea of leaving uh, the uh, Jewish areas in, in Europe. They wanted to, to pray and to be uh, uh, separate in, the, uh, you know, in, their, in their way of, of thinking, in their way of... Uh, uh, praying in their rituals. You had people who were communists. They, th they considered that the liberation of all of humanity is the key to ending uh, anti-Semitism. You had people who were anarchists. You had people who were Bundists, which was a form of nationalism that said Jewish self-determination should take place in Europe. Now then you had Zionists who were saying there's nationalism and we're combining it with colonialism. We're going to take over this piece of land, knowing very well that there's people on it. By the way, anybody that tells you Zionists did not know that uh, there were people on it, they knew there were people on it. The vast majority of the really committed Zionists understood and knew that there were people on it, even if they raised the slogan, a land without a people for a people without a land. So this is what we're dealing with. When we use this nationalism, competing nationalisms framework, we miss out on the real issue, which is that resistance was about anti-colonialism. This was anti-colonial resistance. This was not about developing an independent nationalism. And I'll tell you an additional fact about this. Palestinian nationalism was the least particularists of the nationalisms in the area surrounding it. From the beginning. Because it was always multi-layered with something else. The first Palestinian National Congress demanding, demanded unity with Syria. This was not uh, nationalism based on hating other people. This was not 
nationalism in the, in the, in the sense of, uh, of saying, yeah, yeah, we hate our neighbors, we're different than them. No, this was like, we are part of uh, this na neighborhood. We share everything with it. And however, that does not negate the need for us to confront the responsibilities that come with an encroaching colonial project that is developing on our land and the need to fight and, and resist that. So it's very important to get rid of that framework. Another one, relational history. Relational history, for those who study history, uh, for those who don't study history, you don't need to think about this too much. But I'm a historian, so I'll, 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 t I'll talk to you about it anyways. There's a bunch of scholars that are seen as progressive. They probably you know, th view themselves as progressive. And it's become like very fashionable from the 90s onwards. And what it is, by the way, is a rehearsal of, a, um, of an ideology associated with a left Zionist group uh, uh, that uh, views uh, the solution to this uh, situation uh, as having kumbaya moments like that, you know, that people, if they come, come together, we'll all be uh, uh, happy, you know, we'll, we'll all resolve things. And if only we would initiate uh, Jewish Arab dialogue and Palestinian dialogue, we'll have. Um, an end to this. By the way, I'm all for dialogue and long conversations. I love long conversations with people. It's great. Uh, but uh, uh, not when it uh, involves denying structural realities, not when it involves uh, replacing uh, the, uh, the resolution of these structural realities with uh, pointless, endless conversations. Okay? There's a difference between the two. Okay? If it's a conversation that's based on honesty and recognizing what's going on on the ground, and saying, let's resolve it. I, I'm all for that. I, I love that. It's great. Who, you know, we, we all love, love, love having a good chat where you know, we, we talk about things. But when it's uh, this kind of uh, psychologizing of the conflict, then we have a problem. Uh, we should avoid any form of psycholiz uh, psychologization uh, when it comes to these kind of issues. Uh, it's a dangerous path uh, uh, to take because, again, it uh, uh, acts as a way for covering up for the material realities. So relational history is a variation uh, for, uh, uh, of, of this kind of uh, way of looking at things. It says, oh, for the longest time, we had the dominance of uh, nationalist narratives around this subject. And these nationalist narratives wanted to hide the fact that, uh, that the, uh, 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 the colonized population was having, well, of course, they don't call it that. Was, was having relations with the indigenous population. Somehow, you know, they were meeting together. Oh my God, you know, how miraculous. They were meeting together. You know, they were living, they were living in the same space, yeah, of course. But they, they get so shocked by the fact that, uh, you know, uh, two po uh, you know, postal workers uh, uh, met each other and said uh, hi to each other in their languages, or that uh, people uh, one day organized, decided to organize a strike. Yeah. Things like that. Okay, yeah, of course, people, when you have them in space, they're all human beings. We're all human beings. You know, and if we start from the premise that uh, uh, all human beings are equal and we're all the same, you know, we'd understand how, why people would say hi to each other in the street, even if they uh, come from different ethnicities or nation nationalities. You know, what a ridiculous and preposterous uh, uh, suggestion to be surprised at that. You know, that should be the, the rule, in fact, not the uh, exception. But the situation was so bad in Palestine that, of course, these historians uh, find it shocking. Uh, and what they do not recognize is that it prevents us from understanding that this was not just about you know, joining together and having these kind of conversations or encounters. Because when we think of colonial, and this is, by the way, an important point, not just for Palestine, but for the way we view colonialism across the world. I live in the United States. A lot of people nowadays think they're being progressive when they speak of the colonial encounter. Christopher Columbus showing up in 1492, that's colonial encounter. Uh, conquistadors, colonial encounter. And you know what they use? There's uh, newer, newer versions, they shock you. Uh, negotiated conquest, that's what happened in Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Mexico, 90% of the population was eradicated. It's disgusting, actually. I, I mean, I know, it's, it's so funny, but it's, it's so horrifying at the same time. That same horror that you feel when you're writing on Palestine, you feel it when you, when, you, when you see stuff like that. Negotiated conquest? Oh, why? Oh, because there were some you know, leaders of these communities 
that struck deals with the Spanish in order to confront other local leaders. Wow. Negotiated conquest. 90% of the population decimated. Most of them enslaved. Many of them dying in slavery. Many of them being replaced with slaves from Africa. And you call that negotiated conquest. Unbelievable. And you come to Palestine and you call that what? Oh, relational history. Oh, encounter. And instead of encounter, the colonial encounter, you know, because, you know, just people just encounter each other. You know, it's like, hi, uh, hello, Omar. I've just encountered Omar. That's what happened in colonialism. It's not domination. It's not exploitation. It's not armies. It's not guns. It's not people bombing people while they imprison them, just like what's happening in Gaza today, where you have millions of people in prison, two million people, in 340 square kilometers, they're not allowed to move an inch beyond that. And they're also monitored within that by drones and a regime of surveillance. And every few months, you get them being bombed en masse. And that's called encounter. Or maybe, no, that's self-defense. Sorry, uh, I forgot. Yeah, sometimes they throw uh, these makeshift rockets. That's called self-defense. F-16s, you know, the world's biggest arsenal, everything you can imagine. And I say the world's biggest arsenal because when we speak of the Israeli military, of course it has the American military behind it. They have military agreements, they have endless supplies. They get the new generation weapons that even Britain doesn't get. Britain thinks it has special relationship. You know, the, uh, Theresa May keeps talking, oh, I have a special relationship with Trump. You're not allowed seventh generation fighter jets, okay? You're, you're, you stick to the sixth generation pathetic fighter jets that can't do nothing, okay? Only Israel is allowed seventh generation jets, by the way. Yeah, so if, if, if it does happen that the Israeli Air Force gets an engagement with this Air Force, it will beat it. No, for those, all those uh, triumphalists that are get so excited about Israel having the world, oh, they get such a great Air Force. Here, you have people who are actually fans of this militarism. I'm like, yeah, of course, yeah. Why? Because it gets access to this technology. It doesn't just happen. It's not out of some miracle. Speaking of uh, Zionism as a miracle is another uh, uh, theme you find in this literature. And that's the next point I want to talk about. You find all this desert, desert bloom. You know, they made the desert bloom. I'm like, yeah, by diverting the waters of the River Jordan. Yeah. Like, I was, I was listening the other day to this crazy evangelical channel while I'm driving on my way from Houston to Austin. <laughs> you hear the weirdest stuff when you're driving from Houston to Austin. I, I know there's a couple of people here who have been, who lived in Texas before. They know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's amazing stuff, OK? The guy was like, uh, he's being interviewed uh, for having compiled a new picture book of the miracle of Israel. Miracle of Israel, OK? What's the miracle of Israel? Oh, yeah. You know, the, the, he comes in, he's like, yeah, man, the land, the land was empty. There was nothing. There was nothing. And now look at it now. That there's, there's actual plants in the desert. They're planting stuff in the desert. They, they're producing stuff in the desert, selling it to the world market. And I've documented it all. I have 300 pages of documentation to prove it. You know, he's taking pictures around, you know, of like a plant here, water pump there, like, you know. <laughs> uh, by the way, water pumps. You'd be surprised, they're very important. I was just speaking at a, at a seminar recently in New, York, in New York. If you look at uh, a lot of the Palestinian resistance, it was precisely, in most of the Palestinian operations, early operations in the beginnings of the Palestinian Revolution, they were sabotage operations against these projects. The project to divert the uh, uh, waterway from the Jordan River, the project uh, to uh, build these water plants in the, in the Naqab, which they call the Negev. That's another thing. By the way, if you want to liberate, uh, li we need to liberate language. Stop using Negev, this and that. You know, they, these are all col colonial titles. It's called the Naqab. That's what its people call it. So let's let's for for one second respect their 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 wishes for calling their land the way they want. Okay. So we, we, you go to the Naqab, you know, the Naqab Desert. You find all these projects which are an environmental disaster because the deserts are not supposed to be places for big agricultural production. They're not supposed to be places where the fertile uh, uh, areas in the north that were for historically watered by the River Jordan are paying now for the making these barren areas green. 
So the green areas become barren, and the and the and the or and their soil is affected. I mean, they're still not completely barren because they still get rainfall. But you know, their soil is affected by this. And in the meantime, you know, the desert areas become green, but artificially at a very high cost, and it's an environmental disaster. And uh, of course, uh, de desert vegetation gets destroyed in the process. More importantly, its people get destroyed. You know, that is the essence of colonialism. It's the transformation of space by putting people on the ground. So you have this Zionist miracle literature that, of course, we need to be dealing with. Then we have a very uh, a new trend that a lot of Palestinian historians specialize in. And you know, I don't want to diss my colleagues. I love them all. You know, there, there's, you know, I, I really am. I I'm not into negativity, by the way. We should, we should really celebrate everyone. <laughs> but, but we have to be real as well. You know, we're going to be real. There is a strategy as a result of this massive pressure on Palestinians because they're confronted. They come into academia, and from the beginning, any Palestinian student here knows this. From the beginning, you get welcomed by uh, uh, this wonderful welcome, telling you basically you have to be on the edge every day. You know. Because any word you say is monitored. Any time you can get into trouble. You never know what will happen. Yeah? So you're living this constant life like that, surrounded, besieged, and so on. And you know if you get burnt, there's a lot of good people that would want to help you, that recognize it's bad, but they feel scared to help you. So you know you end up getting completely, for the lack of a better word, we're being filmed. I'm not going to use it. But OK, <laughs> we end up with this situation. So as a result, some people develop defense mechanisms, and we, we end up with really bad historical narratives. You know, especially if they decide to continue despite this uh, pressure. Uh, they feel this, you know, oh, yeah, we need to re re write this history. So they come and tell you, oh, the problem is they use what I called as self-flagellation disguised as autocritique. I want you to remember that title, self-flagellation disguised as autocritique. I know it's, it's long, but it's, it's really, you know, you, you read this stuff, it's amazing. You know, they start by saying, yeah, you know, we, uh, our problem is that we're stuck between Zionism and Palestinian nationalism, the narratives, and somehow good history is about moving away from that, that's the problem. Yeah, now Palestinian nationalism is a problem, you know, when, when we're writing history of that, of that period. It's not that there's uh, decades, decades, of historical writing that erases the Palestinian people. No, it's the, it's the attempt to uh, bring, make the Palestinian people visible, which they refer to as Palestinian nationalism. That is the problem. By the way, there is no such thing as Palestinian nationalism in the conventional nationalist sense. I remember I told you that already. What you find if you study it very closely, it's attempts of people to say, no, do not erase us. And you know why they kept on saying we are a, a people and we have separate characteristics of a people? Because the international order of that period and up to this day says that unless you call the people, then you don't have any rights to your land. That's what they did to the Palestinians. So they were like, oh, no, no, you're just like the other Arabs around you, so you don't have any uh, rights to your land. And they're like, yes, we are just like the other Arabs around us. We love them. You know, we want to be united with them in one state. But... At the same time, we have a right to our land, so we have to call ourselves a people. Okay, this is basically Palestinian nationalism. Anybody that looks at it, seriously, if investigated, you will find this out. Because everybody's actually, when you talk to them at home, they're either, they're, they're always into grand visions, Palestinians. They're always like, yeah, we want to have the whole Arab world liberated, or the whole, tri some are tricontinentalists, they want to liberate uh, everything. Mahmoud Darwish has a poem on this, by the way. And people were like, yeah, yeah. He's like, you know, stop talking about Havana when we still are stuck here, man. Like, we barely managed to liberate ourselves here. But, you know, of course, a lot of people wanted to liberate Havana and everywhere, you know, um, which is great, yeah. And a lot of people are, are communists and a lot of people are Islamists, even. They want the unity of the Islamic world, you know. Let's be honest. They're into these grand projects. What that shows you is, is that it's not a particularist, closed minded, parochial, no, no, I'm Palestinian, that's it. You know, there is no neo Canaanite trend in Palestine. Self flagellation disguised as autocritics uh, tells you it's all the fault of these Palestinian nationalists, and these Palestinian nationalist leaders. If only they could speak English better. And by the way, I'm, I'm be, I'll be honest to you, this is one of the most colonial tropes that you hear all the time. There are people that I love who are some of the greatest thinkers against colonialism who even said that. Unfortunately, the late Edward Said, in his critiques of Oslo, 
and I respect his critiques of Oslo. They were, they, they were in many ways, of course, Oslo was a disaster. But when you go and say the problem is uh, Yasser Arafat did not know how to speak English well, come on. How many English people know how to speak Arabic? Why is this colonial mentality that somehow everybody has to know English fluently and you know, brilliantly? You know? We get a dozen critiques of that kind endlessly. We have to stop this. Because yes, there are problems and uh, serious problems with leadership. But also you cannot reduce a structural ongoing continuum into just a crisis of leadership. The crisis of leadership reflects the structural situation, not the other way around. It is because of the mass defeat that has engulfed the Arab world in a very particular context of the end of the Cold War, of the uh, endless neo-colonialism that has affected the Arab world, where, where you had even sovereign states like Iraq fall again on the hands of Britain and the United States. You know, and it's now basically, that's quite a big deal. You have entire parts of this region that have fell apart there's a loss of sovereignty, economic sovereignty, political sovereignty. You know, we have here an expert on economic sovereignty, Sham uh, Zafidi, he teaches at King's. You can check him out. He wrote a, just a fabulous book now on, on the central banks, Central Bank of Lebanon. You see what, I'm, what, what we're talking about there. There's enormous sovereignty crisis here, okay? When you come and you want to say, oh, the problem, if only we had better leaders, oh, if, my favorite, they tell you, oh, if only there was Nelson Mandela, or, or if there was Gandhi, everything would have been solved. And I'm like, as if Nelson Mandela or Gandhi had automatically solved everything by just appearing. They didn't sit, have to sit in jail for like 20 plus years. They didn't have to you know, uh, work on building these movements for decades. They didn't have to suffer uh, enormous losses, deaths, and attacks of the sort that we see in Palestine, in South Africa or India. No, it just appeared just because uh, the big, wonderful leader came in and magically everything changed. Or they come and tell you, oh, if only there was a Parsi and an MLK. And like, as if the current situation of African Americans is resolved now after, uh, after the uh, sacrifice of MLK. Look at it now. New Jim Crow multiplied by 10. It's a horror. Anybody that lives in that country can see the amount of racism that people are getting shot in the streets. And yes, there was MLK, and there were great people like Angela Davis, great leaders in the African-American community. Is it a crisis of leadership that is a problem in the African-American community today? Or is it the structural reality? Now, I do, I do wish we had a different leader other than Abu Mazen. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I really do. But also, I, we have to remember, who put Abu Mazen in power? You know, who forced him to be the prime minister, forced him on the people. Who created the situation where it's, a, it's basically the entire Palestinian Authority is there to circumvent the PLO, to undermine it, to weaken it, to create parallel structures that then control our people. But you know what, as a Palestinian, I'm not going to hate on the Palestinian institutions, the original institutions that were set up to liberate Palestine. I'm going to point out to the need to reclaim those institutions, the need to turn them back into their original purpose, which is not the control of the Palestinian people, but the liberation of that people. Now, which brings me to the uh, need to liberate the present from some colonial categories that we see today. Unfortunately, when we're talking about Palestinians today, one of the ways we contribute to uh, the colonization of that space mentally, even when we're trying to help, by the way, a lot of people are great people when they talk about Palestine, but they just don't have the tools to talk about it in a way, or they forget because the general atmosphere around them is filled with these grinding frameworks and constant pushing that entraps us. You know, and unless we uh, get out of that logic completely. Do what the, these, you know, fancy critical theorists call like uh, going into an Archimedean point. You know, reach. You know, I'm, I'm not going to use that language to you, but it just means basically let's get out of completely from the framework that's existing now, so that we're able to critique it. Yeah. We have to exit certain frameworks. One framework is to just keep on talking about the Israelis. 
I don't like talking about the Israelis when we're talking about what's happening in Palestine. You know why? Because we need to center the Palestinians. And if you center the Palestinians, then you avoid the whole set of traps that are associated with talking about Israel. They want you to be talking about Israelis because they want you to, uh, they want to, to say, oh, you're just hating on Israelis. You know what? None of us are hating on Israelis. Maybe there are some people that, that are haters, but they're like a tiny, minuscule percentage of the people in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. We are here to support the Palestinian people. And as Palestinians, we are here to represent ourselves. Okay, that's very important. And that has to be understood by everybody. And the way it gets understood is every time we speak about Palestine, let's talk about Palestine. Let's talk about the Palestinians. Let's focus on them. Let's talk about the effects on them. Let's talk about what's happening to them. Let's talk about the way they want to talk about themselves. Now, there are some obstacles in this regard because some people are entrapped also in this uh, kind of uh, uh, identity politics framework that makes it very difficult for people to speak about Palestine in a liberated way. And by the way, the initial uh, uh, project of identity politics, it has some positive things to it. You know, of course, it's important for us to recognize uh, dynamics and the way they operate in political space. But sometimes when it comes to things like Palestine, it does tend towards individualizing the question. And that's very dangerous because we want to build a mass movement here. You know, we have a mass movement here. We want to make it even more massive. Massive and massive and massive, like this big. You know, how do we do that if the main way we speak about Palestine is say, oh yeah, it has to be the correct person speaking about it, otherwise it doesn't work. You know? No, everybody can speak about Palestine so long as everybody has a good uh, understanding of their position in relation to it. So that uh, as they have a good understanding of what uh, scholars call positionality. They reflect on their position. They're not claiming to represent the Palestinians. They're not claiming to own their voice. Okay? But they're speaking about the realities as they see it on the ground. That is the way to deal with this or to deal with any question of solidarity across the world. Any question of solidarity, whether it's social or, uh, you know, because otherwise we'll, we'll, uh, the only people who will ever speak about anything uh, uh, are the people who are in an ultimate position of victimhood. And you know something? The very idea of victimhood is a colonial idea. Because people who are engaged in anti-colonialism do not think in terms of, oh yeah, this is just about uh, uh, the effects on individuals in that way. The turning collectivities into individuals was what they were doing in Palestine from the very beginning when they issued the Balfour Declaration, which, by the way, acknowledged, if you notice, the uh, uh, religious rights of the people there and uh, their civic rights, which means their individual rights. You know, your right to practice, uh, to worship what you want, and your right to be tried in court like everybody else. Yeah? That's what they acknowledged. What they refused to acknowledge is the real deal, which would have protected the people there which is their political rights. The only political rights that were acknowledged were those of the colonists. They were told, they, yeah, yeah, you have a right to come from uh, Poland or from uh, Russia or from any uh, Eastern European country or Western European country or any other country in the world and establish an, a, a nation state here at the expense of the people there, of course. So the re reduction of Palestinians to individuals is, is that dynamic. And when we deal in the categories of victimhood, we're always, by the way, individualizing it. Yeah, I'm being told to wrap up, but I'm going to ignore that because uh, there's more th things to be said, a few things to be said about this. And I think it's a very important thing to think about. The problem with this logic when it comes to Palestine nowadays is that it disenfranchises Palestinians as well. We've reached a stage where I've had so many conversations with people where they say, oh, I, I, Palestinians I'm talking. You know, I just had a conversation with a student in New York. She was like, I'm not a refugee. I'm like, why? She's like, because, you know, I live uh, in a New York apartment and I'm wearing uh, 
whatever she was wearing, she buys from equivalent to Primark there or whatever it is, you know. Uh, that makes her privilege, you know. She doesn't have holes in her uh, pants, you know, so she can't be a refugee. I'm like, what a ridiculous, preposterous state we've reached in now, where we're thinking like that. That to be a refugee, you have to be dirt poor? Is that what a refugee is? A refugee is a political category. A refugee means that somebody drove you out of your land and that you're living in it, living outside of it. You're living in New York because you can't be in Palestine. Okay? So if you're in London or New York, I don't care if you're a billionaire, you're still a refugee. And the majority of people, our people are not billionaires, by the way. But, you know, you have these now, even working class kids thinking like that. They're like, oh, yeah, I, you know, uh, I live in, uh, in, um, in West London or in Sheffield or whatever, so th therefore I, I can't say, you know, I'm too privileged. I'm like, no, you are Palestinian. You are a refugee. That is a political category. The attempt to reduce us into a humanitarian crisis was something that every refugee camp in the areas around Palestine has fought from 1948 onwards, from the minute refugees were forced out of their land. That is what they were fighting against. They were saying, if you read that literature, if you look at what they were raising, their slogan, their constant appeals was always, do not turn us into a humanitarian issue. We are not, uh, and they, they used to complain always about uh, UNRWA, which nowadays, you know, we have a habit to sympathize with UNRWA because of course it's under attack. Of course we sympathize with all international institutions that are there to serve the Palestinian people, great. But we should not remember that the refugees were always saying, look, the danger with these institutions, honor one, whatever, they're there just to alleviate the international community guilt on the crime they committed with the partition resolution. And they think they can buy us with a couple of bags of flour. If they think that, they're wrong. They think they can buy us with the provision of uh, high schools, they're wrong. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that the flour in the high schools should not be continued, by the way. Don't get me wrong. Of course they have to, because there's people that need them. And because these people were, are in these refugee camps because of policies of the governments here. Not just in the past, but in the present. Because this is the only case I know of where you have refugees. When it came to the Rwandans, the British government was loud and clear, oh yeah, the Rwandans and the refugees have to go back home. When it came to the Bosnians, you know, they were loud and clear about that. This is the only case where you hear them and I'm going to use a, a theme that, that karma has spoken endlessly about, and I wish that we would re remember it. We treat them as an obstacle to peace instead of actually the solution. Peace should come to them. They are the main people who are being affected by this. We are the main people who are affected by this. Now, I don't care. I'm wearing a suit, you know, all of that. I'm a refugee. Okay? We have to understand that. And this is political. Because I cannot go back home, I'm a refugee. So, when we're dealing with this situation, we cannot continue operating in this colonial framework that says the only true Palestinians are the Palestinians in living in a tiny portion of Palestine, 22% of Palestine, West Bank and Gaza, and all those people in 48, uh, all those people in the surrounding countries, they're not Palestinian. Maybe if they're in a refugee camp, yeah, they come and talk, talk about refugees as a, it's a humanitarian case. Uh, but it's the Palestinian nationalists that are the problem because they're trying to tell these refugees to continue to want to have the right of return. Allahu Akbar. You know, it's not the refugees that had fought for the right of return all these decades. It's not them that organized Palestinian politics to begin with. Where do you think all of these Palestinian parties came from? From the refugee camps. Anybody that knows anything about Palestine knows that. Okay? No, it's the diaspora Palestinians that are trying to incite them to these big slogans. You know? And it's a, basically a bunch of diaspora Palestinian intellectuals that keep talking about right of return. So, you know, and that perpetuates their misery. What a colonial way of speaking. And here I will use identity politics. You know, for a, a white British person to come and tell me that when their government is so deeply enmeshed in this, we have a problem. That me, why? Not because they're white, not because they're British, but because they have no sense of positionality. They have not reflected on the fact that, look, I come from the country that caused this problem. 
that caused the expulsion of these people. And I come to one of the expelled people. In fact, I come to all of them by writing my books and publishing them, telling them that when they speak of their rights, they're wrong. Because they shouldn't speak about their rights. They should just immigrate to other countries, seek better economic opportunities. This is what we are dealing with today. And that is a colonial framework. And you'll find this in books now about Palestinian refugee camps, especially in Lebanon, by the way. Okay, It's a big problem. So when we're dealing with this, and I'm going to wrap this up, at the end of the day, we have to find a way of speaking about the Palestinian people in a way that centers them in a way that confronts the attempt to fragment them, in a way that confronts the bad frameworks, uh, the frameworks that cover up for what happened in Palestine, what is taking place today, and what is likely to continue to take place in the near future unless we do something about it. Thank you very much.